I, even when I graduated college, um, my dad had ideas for me, which was like going to get my master's in business or getting my law degree. I think, uh, you know, as I answer these questions, I'll think about what's kind of helpful, you know? And so a lot of times there'll be ideas, either you will have them or someone else will have them about what you should be or the path you're on. And sometimes they're right, I guess. And then sometimes they're, they were kind of like guesses, you know? Um, and they're not, uh, they turn out not to be the path that you're gonna wind up on. And so I then did get a job and in public relations because I, I kind of figured out in college that I was okay at writing. And so what, what kind of, how could I have a career and make money writing? It never occurred to me you could make money writing uh, funny things because I didn't have anybody in the entertainment business in my family. And so uh, I went into public relations and, you know, I wasn't miserable, but I, I, I knew, I looked around, I'm like, you know, if this were my thing, I'd be really happy right now because I got a good job out of school and I wasn't. And so it was a very natural drive. Like I just was going to comedy clubs all the time. And then someone said, hey, do you want to write promos, um, on-air promos for MTV? They need someone to do some of their comedy shows and stuff like that. So I kind of, without knowing it, was looking to do something like that. And luckily, I was, luck is a big part of everything. I was in the right place at the right time. And so then I started, uh, I started gravitating towards where I eventually wound up. And I wish, you know, if I had to do it over again, I didn't even move to Los Angeles where I really started doing what I do till I was 30. So I really wish I was like, I remember once a mom is the end of the long answer. A mom of a, my best friend goes, when we were in like sophomores or freshmen in college, she goes, you should just move to LA and start writing for uh, sitcoms. And I just, it was like, a, I didn't even know what she t was talking about. Oh my God, I wish I had taken that advice. I wish I had just moved here and asked people, how do you like your coffee? You know, uh, I'll work for free because I'll bartend at night or something. And I remember, and all right, this is, I promise this is the end of a long answer. I no, remember, it's good. I remember seeing Raising Arizona in the theater and going home and telling my dad, and I was living basically in a closet in their apartment in New York City. New York City apartments are very small. And I yeah. built a loft so I could have a desk under it and hang my clothes. So I built, I built this wooden platform and put a mattress on top. I mean, it, it, it was the size, it really was a closet. And I remember coming home and saying, I just saw this movie that rocked my world and I should just find out where their offices are and arrive there with coffee and say, what do you need me to clean or do for you? And that was the Coen brothers who were kind of nobodies. And um, man, I kind of wish I had done that too, because it took me years to kind of get back to that level of, uh, of realizing what I wanted to do and going for it. Yeah. So that was a great answer, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not easy. It's really hard, I have to mm. say. One of the most stressful things, I had a lot of trouble getting to sleep in my 20s because the wheels would just turn like, I'm never gonna find what I wanna do. Mm. I'm never gonna be, I'm gonna be homeless. Um, I, you know, uh, just a lot of worry about that stuff. Um, yeah. And I, I guess the answer is, you know, hopefully, you can avoid some of that by following, sort of listening to yourself. If I really listened to myself, I would have been like, hey, you really like doing this. I'm sure there's a way you can make your way in the world going down that path. But also, the other side of it is, don't beat yourself up too much. Sometimes it doesn't come, you know, as early as you'd like it. And, and you know, you just can't beat yourself up and literally lose all that sleep over it. Yeah. Um... Is there any special education or training you need to be a comedy writer besides just like writing classes? Because I, I know that's a big part of it, but is there yeah. anything different? Or is it just like connections? I think a challenging childhood is uh, one of the prerequisites. I think uh, some pain and awkwardness. Uh, I've run into very, very few 
comedy writers who's, uh, who have married parents. If they are married, they're complete lunatics, according to them. Um, so uh, I think you're a very funny kid, though, Cadence. And, uh, and so is Olivia. I think you guys, and you have exquisite taste, way better than I did at your age. So, like, you're very advanced. So I would, the answer for you would be, uh, not to break up your parents and ruin your family. I think it would be writing and reading. Um, reading funny people. Uh, I remember the first time Woody Allen had three books, I think, of short stories. David Sedaris is a new one. Um, and then part of writing, a big part of writing is brevity, brevity. You know, Shakespeare said brevity is the soul of wit. Shorter, 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 you know, the shorter you can make things, um, the better. And usually it helps, it helps almost all comedy. Um, so what that is, is an efficiency of writing. Like every word should, should count. There's a great book, Strunk and White. Those are the authors. And it might be called On Writing. And man, you really realize, you really learn how to write very effectively and get your point across and not repeat yourself and all that stuff. So I would say, yeah, writing classes for sure. And then, you know, there, you know there's one saying, there's no such thing as writing, just rewriting. So just write, uh, which is advice I give myself all the time because I still don't follow it as much. Like I'm very scared to write that first thing. It's not gonna be funny. It won't be good. It's very, very daunting and intimidating looking at a blank page, but um, just get that first draft out because it doesn't matter. My friend had a psychiatrist and part in the French for the psychiatrist. And he went to him because he was having all this trouble procrastinating and not writing and missing dead and all this. And, you know, the psychiatrist goes, uh, sit down and just write a piece of shit. He's like, that should be your goal. Like when you leave here today, go home and write a piece of shit. Whether it's one page, 40 pages, whatever it is, just get it down because then it'll be, it's not a blank page anymore. And you can start rewriting and refining it. And, and but you've started. Starting is the hardest thing. Yeah. And they'll teach you that in a writing class. Mm -hmm. Um. What's your favorite part of your job? Favorite and least favorite. Uh, the least favorite. Uh, that's very telling. I begin with the negative. The least favorite is uh, is how. Um, unfair the entertainment business can be a little bit. It doesn't respect boundaries. Um, it's very like, you know, for all the years I worked in late night as an example, like you're on that show, there's a show, you're on that show schedule. So spring break, yeah, I don't have one. Uh, I have to work because the show, we're doing four hours of TV that week at say Corden or Ellen DeGeneres. And so it's like, this is the week I have. And if that's not the week my kids have, that's, that's awful. And um, same with summer. Summers can be very, very busy in entertainment because everyone's getting ready for the fall season. So I don't like that about my about the job. It's also can be very, very hard work. It's hard to be funny every day. Um, increasingly, the news, uh, in my opinion, is depressing and heavy. Uh, it's great when you can make light of it, and it's actually very effective if you're writing topical jokes on like a late night show to to make fun of some of our leaders who need that. Uh, some of the press. Uh, don't do a good enough job at calling people out. So anyway, there's that. Um, and then the part I love best are the people, I'd say. Uh, there's nothing makes me happier than being in a writing room. Quite honestly, it's like, it's, it's like when you're over here and Olivia, you and I are laughing at something and then like, oh, did you see this video? And you're kind of, you know, finding funnier and funnier things. And that's what you do. And that's what you will do with like an original idea. You'll be like, what if, you know, they're selling Christmas trees, but they're out, so they're selling them to cat, whatever it is. And then the other what if, what if, and it's a very creative, collaborative process where you're kind of building, building something. Um, so I'd say the people. Uh, and, and I've worked also with some of the funniest people on earth, and I, I'm not saying that lightly, like whether it's Robin Williams or, you know, whoever, like really giant people who very often are vulnerable and and have some um, wounds, I guess you could call it. And like, they've gone through some tough stuff and, and they're struggling. And those are my favorite people are people who, easily my favorite people in the world are people who find a way to have a sense of humor 
because life's crazy. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know how many grown-ups of your interview are going to tell you that. But it's, it's the craziest thing in the world. We're all going to die. Like, if you think about it too long, you'll literally lose your mind. So you have, to, you have to have fun. You have to realize, well, this is what we got. And there's no sense in, in uh, just dwelling on that it's all going to end, which is crazy. So you might as well try to have fun and try to make people laugh and have fun. That's kind of my, my thinking on it. And that's, so that's when it's at its best, is when you can do that. And, and the people you're with have figured that out, by the way. So that's why you're working with them. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. What advice do you have for a person who wants to be a comedy writer? Well, you know, the writing we talked about earlier, um, seeing as much as you can, kind of identifying. You know, a lot of people will tell you, oh, find your voice. I don't know. I've had many, many, many different voices. It also depends on who I'm writing for, because really I have to get their voice then, you know what I mean? And then it's a perfect marriage if my voice or sensibility is close to the host who I'm writing for. And your voice can often influence them too. Uh, the, every host has their favorite writers and, uh, and it's not just because they can write in their voice, but they're, they're learning stuff from the writer also. Um, I would say, yeah, I mean, there's so many different types of comedy. Um, and some of the best comedy is actually also not even comedy. It's when a drama has funny stuff in it, you know? Um, I just saw a movie last night, which was tough, called The Marriage Story, and it is far from a comedy, but the funny parts in it, everyone laughed really hard because it was like comic relief, like it was relieving that tension. Um, and th that's very important. So I would say, um, yeah, uh, very specifically, I would start reading The Onion. Uh, the Onion is a newspaper out of the Wisconsin, out of, co out of a college, it's a student newspaper. And that is arguably one of the funniest things being written and has been since I think the 90s. There's a book on their collected headlines. It's a parody of a newspaper and they are incredible. I would have uh, told you this, but you've already done it. I'd watch The Office. Um, and then you're gonna start being told things that maybe you don't think are funny yet, like The British Office, which I think is the funniest thing I've ever seen, taking nothing away from the American one. Um, I would start seeing Woody Allen movies. I would see, you're probably too young, but keep it in mind, not too young because it's inappropriate, but uh, I think it's more sophisticated humor and more subtle maybe, but well, there's many Woody Allens which are not subtle, like uh, Sleeper and a couple of others, uh, but Annie Hall is one of the funniest movies. Raising Arizona is one of the funniest movies. I would look at top 10 lists of the funniest movies. I would look at top 10 lists of the funniest books. Confederacy of Dunces blew me away. I was in college when I read it though. Uh, I still think it's the funniest book I've ever read. But The Onion is every single day they're gonna put out funny stuff and it's really, really that brevity I told you about. They'll just have headlines. <laughs> you just can't believe how short they are and how good they are. Um, so exposing yourself is the short answer. Exposing yourself to funny things. Um, and there's, there's plenty of lists. There's short stories by legends who I'm not even remembering right now, Calvin Trilling and people like that. I love The Far Side. The Far Side is even shorter than short. Sometimes there aren't even words. It's just an illustration, one, one sort of panel. That guy, all comedy writers worship that guy. That guy's amazing. Saturday Night Live is great because every week you're gonna see many different voices, many different tones, absurd humor literal humor, um, you know, sort of a sar sarcasm. You'll see all of it, parody, uh, commercial parodies. So Saturday Night Live is a great place to go and to see all their reruns also. So, and stand up. There's a couple of masters right now. In my opinion, I think Dave Chappelle is a master. I think uh, Bill Burr is a master. I actually, it's a, it's a tough name to bring up now. I thought Louis C.K. was a master. When you go back and see his stand up about having kids, I think you, could very much relate to what little animals they are um, and how crazy making young kids can be. And he talks about it from the perspective of he and his wife um, with his daughters and uh, who are uh, a little older than you. Uh, one might even be your age, but he's a master. Um, there's a lot of them. So basically exposing yourself to that as much as you can. Yeah. Um, 
what's the what's the project you're most proud of? Because I know you've worked on a lot of stuff. Uh, great question. Yeah, there was one. You'll find like comedy people love drama, <laughs> love non-comedy. I think there's a there's a little bit of a sadness in all of it. Not all, but in most of comedy writers. Most I know, for instance, cry easily, including me. Um, we love, uh, I mean, I guess everyone does, but we really love very serious documentaries, you know, about murderers and stuff like that. But um, I would say there was one project, it was a documentary I did with Zach Galifianakis about this comedian. And this takes on a totally different tone now, but he was, um, just this very interesting stand up and it turned out he had mental illness. And so he had a nervous breakdown or a bipolar episode that was very serious and was institutionalized at UCLA Medical uh, Center. So that project was called Enjoy It with Brody Stevens and it was on HBO Digital first and then Comedy Central. And it was a documentary about a comedian and that's the project I enjoyed most. Um, There's a lot more to that story, but that's the short answer. I like late night a lot just because there's a plus and minus every night, everything you've worked on kind of goes in the wood chipper or the shredder and you start from nothing the next day, Um, which is not totally true. We had some things like carpool karaoke's, but generally when you're in late night and topical stuff like the daily show and all that, uh, there's a, there's a nice thing about um, starting fresh Uh, in sitcoms. I had a sitcom. That was the hardest job I've ever had. Uh, We did 22 episodes and that was a grind and that was really, really hard and unfair on my life and my girls. Um, And that is when you never start from scratch the next day, really. You're always trying to build and fix and improve and improve and improve on these storylines that you have and uh, things like that. Um, I've never written a movie I imagine a comedy movie is very, very difficult. It's probably why, because I have like two or three ideas and I'm just scared of them. And, and I think then you get a lot of notes. Notes are, if you do go into television comedy writing, which is kind of one of the only areas, uh, you're dealing then with notes and sometimes notes from people who have never done comedy and, and are not funny people. And you're getting no, com- notes on your comedy from them. So that, that's challenging. And I think a movie, is just noted to death almost forever. Um, and then you can't get the people you want. So my hat's off to people that do movies. Um, I think that would be very difficult. I think ultimately it would then be very, very rewarding once you've done it and you have a comedy movie out there. So um, yeah, I, that's what I'd say. Um, what does an average day at your job look like? I know uh, being a comedy writer, you don't work all the time and sometimes comedy writers do look for work but on I know this is kind of a hard question to answer because there are probably different uh job conditions depending on what pro uh what project you're working on next but uh is there any like overall they're pretty similar believe it or not it's not as hard as you think I I totally appreciate you being that respectful and also anticipating that because you're right it normally would be a hard question They are different, but generally you all gather in the morning. What's nice is you gather usually later. A lot of comedy people have this in common. There's a little bit of trouble trying to get to sleep, trying to shut shut off the thinking. That's another unfair part of being creative. It's it's not a nine to five job. I trust me, I would go crazy if I worked in a bank cubicle, but a bank cubicle has some pluses. You can plan vacations. You go home at 5.30 every night. If you want to join a gym and be like, yeah, because I'm going to go there on my way home every Tuesday and Thursday. That's the craziest concept in the world to me because I might be in New York or in a car shooting a karaoke, depending on when the talent can do it. Like, so, um, but generally you start later, which is nice. You start about 10 a.m. Like you get to get to work around then. Some of them, of course, are super early, especially if you're shooting, you could be there at 5 a.m., but Generally, you get there at 10, you gather, it's very social. Uh, you talk about what you saw last night. You talk about the Daily Show. You talk about, you know, who was on Fallon? Was anything funny on? You talk about viral videos. There's so much comedy on Instagram now. So you do that generally. 
and hopefully then that will lead to this is what we should do if you're in late night, uh, something's inspiring you, or you then talk about what needs to get done that day. You then very often break up. Uh, some places have you write alone. Some people are better at writing alone. Some people really can't write alone. They need a, one partner or a room of eight people. Um, and then you kind of get to work. You know, you've identified, you know, what has to be done. And um, if you're in a daily show, which is like the daily show or late night with Corden or Ellen or other places I've worked, you will have a very looming deadline, which is you are doing an hour of television that night. So then there are deadlines that you're well aware of during the day. So you'll meet for an hour, maybe you have to put an end to it because you'll talk all day otherwise. And then you got to get writing and then probably you write for two hours. You can't write that long without stopping. It eventually be, tailors off and you become unproductive. So you take, you'll take breaks or change this task to a different task. So maybe two hours, those are your first deadlines. Again, you're just writing. The real writing is rewriting. You then get them back, you get notes from people, you rewrite, you get them ready for that day. If it's a sitcom, you'll have a self-imposed deadline. Like we should really get this rough draft done by today. And then it's like, who wants to be in the group that's working? A lot of sitcoms will have two stories. Like in the office, you can imagine Michael's going uh, on a road trip in his car somewhere, but at the office, another office sometimes had three or four stories. So sometimes you'll break up, who wants to take the B story? which is Dwight is doing some fire inspection. Who wants to take the C story? Who wants to do the A story and finish that? You know, you worked on it yesterday. Let's switch it up. Let's get fresh eyes on it, you know, stuff like that. So, and that's kind of the day. And then, you know, when there's no real crazy deadline, like we got to shoot the show tomorrow. Or we got to get this in by the end of the day. Hopefully you get out at like, you know, six or seven o'clock, you know, something like that. Um, probably not really before six generally. So. You kind of have those banker's hours, but it just shifted a little later. And then very often you're there very, very late. Like when I had my sitcom, uh, I, you know, I just said, listen, I have to get home. I had my girls only on Mondays and Tuesdays. And then every other weekend I was like, I got to get home for dinner. So let's call it Tuesdays, no matter what. And everyone else stayed. And even though I was the boss and the creator, I was the first one to go. Uh, and then they stayed. And then on the other night, I, I had to stay at work and I got them a sitter and stuff. So sitcoms especially tend to have crummier hours. You're there, you know, you order dinner and then you stay there for dinner and you're probably there to like 10 o'clock or nine o'clock or something like that. But that's kind of, that's kind of every job, I'm, every type of comedy writing I'm thinking of. Oh, Saturday Night Live has crazy, crazy, crazy. But that's why they have so many weeks off. And a week off in comedy really isn't a week off because you're really feeling the pressure of you got to come back to work with ideas. And again, it's, you can't shut it off when you're walking around. You're like, like, um, I just was at, I just went into Nordstrom's earlier today on the way, on the way home. I had a Christmas shop a little, and they had a, they had a stand in there. That's uh, that like you think it was deals. And the sign said gifts under $150. And I was like, that sign might as well say I'm in the wrong store. Like that's, the, the deals are under, under 150. That's a pretty high cap. Well, that if I was working on Sign I Live, like I'm taking that with me and that's going to become a sketch. Like there's no off switch. So your weeks off really aren't weeks off, either are your vacations. But like Sign I Live, it's such high pressure, um, which is sketch, you know, which is a sketch type of comedy writing, which I haven't talked about, which I have done. Um, that you're always kind of mining your life and the world for material. So um, you're kind of always on in a way. And the older you become, you'll feel less pressure and hopefully have an off switch. It's, it's hard to develop that early because you're trying to make your way in the world and you're trying to make a name for yourself. So that's the unfair part, but um, it can also be very enjoyable. Just know that, yeah, I'm gonna keep a journal I'm gonna use my phone. Don't ever, 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 ever trust you'll remember a funny idea like, oh, I don't have to write it down. You will definitely forget it. Um, especially if it wakes you up or you had a dream, you will definitely forget it. Always write it down. Use the voice memo app in your phone for anything funny. And that'll help too, because then you can you know, maybe put it aside and not, um, and not have anxiety about remembering it or trying to come up with new stuff. So that answers your question. Yeah, that was great. That totally answered my question. Uh, one last one. 
Yeah. This one is like the basis of my entire project. This one is, uh, what does success mean to you? Yeah. Um, it's a very good, difficult question. Um, I would, I mean, listen, it comes down to happiness. Uh, remember my note, we're all going to die. So it comes down, to, <laughs> it comes down to happiness and being, a, to me, being a good person and being, and feeling like, I'll speak for myself because not a lot of people feel this about their jobs. Uh, I feel like I want to be making a difference and doing like good in the world. Now, what, what I mean by that, it sounded critical. Poor bankers, because all I'm doing is crapping on what they do. But like, if I was a banker in a nine to five job, I, I see in their defense, a lot of those people won't define themselves like by their job. They will then be involved in charities. They will then uh, identify themselves as a family person, you know, almost above that. You know, like when, you know, like they say, like when you're on your deathbed, you know, you, you never hear the regret. Oh, I wish I had spent more time in the office. So those people will maybe identify themselves by charities or what they do or their involvement in the community. Um, a hobby or their country club or golf or whatever it is, like they will derive enjoyment outside of it. When you're a creative, it's, it's very often the case that you are really, that's who you are. Uh, as I said, you're finding your voice, you, even if you're working for a host. So I define success, getting back to your question, as when I'm happy and when I'm feeling happy. And it can't be that easy. You can't just wait. You can't wait for happiness to find you or, oh, yeah, I was happy in that job. I wasn't in this. Life is unfair and life's too short, you, when you're in a job that you don't like, you have to find ways to be happy. Otherwise you won't be. So you have to get some definitions of, this is the part I'm gonna, you know, uh, sort of focus on or think about, uh, which makes me happy. And then the other stuff is really hard work. Like, you know, listen, ditch diggers, uh, they hopefully find a way to be happy um, and it's an attitude and you approach it but there's no denying you are digging ditches or laying bricks or even worse jobs, way worse jobs than that. Um, but it's necessary and you're doing that to, you know, buy yourself uh, time off and, you know, get money and, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, it funds whatever else you want to do in life. But um, you have to have a way to figure out how to derive happiness, like kind of from whatever uh, job you're at. And then, Part of that, it's, it's almost like if, as if you asked another question, which is, you know, one of the keys, I think, to professions, and most people fall short of this in some way, because it's, it's absolutely, you've won the lottery if you can do this. If you can find something you enjoy, something you're interested in, something you like doing as your career, you won't feel like you're working of course there's going to be work and there's going to be hard work and there's going to be frustrations along the way. But generally you're not going to be one of those people like the ditch digger who I should say the unhappy ditch digger. If you're a happy ditch digger, you found it. Awesome. But if you're the unhappy ditch digger, um, it's hard to derive. You know, I, I doubt many people are like, you know what I want? When I grow up, I really want to take ditches. Um, maybe there are those people, God bless them. I'm not one of them. I'm not. Uh, so if you can find what you want to do, um, you've really won the lottery. You've really done well in life. I think if you're doing what you want to do and if that's working for a charity, if that's being a teacher, uh, whatever it is, and all jobs come with challenges. So don't get me wrong. It's not a cakewalk, but in a weird way, you'll also derive more pleasure from the hard work that you do if it's in an area that ultimately you enjoy doing. Um, so that would be the goal and try to listen to that voice when you're in school, in high school, in college. And don't try not to put too much pressure on yourself. I don't know how anyone knows what they wanna do when they're in college. I really don't. 
Some doctors feel they have a calling or architects. I wasn't that lucky. Um, but I do know if I listen to my voice a little earlier, as I come in full circle to the first question and how this interview started, there was a pull there. I just ignored it. I also turned it off because I had my dad's voice in my head saying, you got to get a real job, you know? Um, and so I, I identified what I do is not real. Um, and frivolous and more like fun or a hobby. Um, comedy writing can be easily dismissed, but it's it, years later, you know, when I was in my 30s, he came to visit me and I was running the Late Late Show. And it was wild experience to hear my dad who had been a businessman his whole life. Um, he couldn't believe how hard I worked. Like he looked around, he's like, you do an hour show five nights a week. And he saw, I was trying to have a conversation with him and he saw like 20, literally no less than 20 people coming up with like what seemed like life and death questions on which hats he gonna wear, like or whatever it was. It was this crazy, it was like putting on a play every night. And I had all the answers and so he just couldn't believe it. And it was such a validation in a way. And so that would be my advice to you is don't view it as not a real job. Um, I don't think you will grow, growing up in this city. I grew up in New York where it wasn't a real job at that time. So. I don't know, I'm rambling, as I will do, but uh, I would just say, try to listen to that voice. Don't put too much pressure on you if you don't hear it. If you're like, what the hell is pulling me? Is anything pulling me towards what I should be doing? Um, and if you're well read and, you know, and can write, uh, you can also pay the bills, you know, other ways, uh, you know, with writing like I do with public relations or something like that, you know, news being a journalist, something like that as you try to find your way in comedy. So, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Of course. Do you that think, was it. is this like, so you're interviewing a lot of, a lot of older, or are they older people, almost all of them? Um, most of them are, well, yeah, they're about your age. Like, people, I mean, anyone who, uh, who I think That's have interesting project, jobs. Right? Yeah, right. or just like, jobs that are either hard to come by or jobs that are just yeah like i guess hard to come by and yeah i guess that okay all right well you have a real advantage and i don't want to embarrass you but you are really as you know one of my favorite people you are a really good kid and that goes a long way in Com just to speak on my profession in comedy writing because when you're interviewing people you're like do i want to basically live with this guy for the next what could be three or four years like do i want to spend every day in a room with this or is this person a lunatic or are they selfish or are they do they not seem like a nice person if you can be funny and a nice person uh you will be caught a lot i'm not i don't want to underestimate how hard it is to find, especially your first job and all that. But you have a lot going for you, is what I'm saying. And that's rewarded. Being a good person, I think very often is not rewarded as much in business and in the legal professions, maybe even the medical field. They don't care. Listen, I don't care if he's a good guy. Is my knee going to be fixed? That's a legitimate thing to say. In comedy, though, being a good person goes a long way long way you also by definition have to be an empathetic person how else would you write the office where he looks at the camera like you heard what i just heard right that's a crazy person like how else do you write that unless you know that the viewer is feeling like this person's a loon you know so you have a lot going for you um in any field cadence but um in comedy writing already not only are you funny but you're funny, I think, because you're a good person. So. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thank you. Of course. I, yeah. Um, my babysitter is here. He babysits me and my brother sometimes. And so I actually have a question for him. I know you wrote Tosh.0 for a while. Yeah, yeah. But I uh, so what was it thing. called? I shit on my dick. <laughs> One of the things was uh, I shit on my dick. Yeah. Do you remember that one? I actually don't. I was there. So I created the show and then they thought they were canceling it at one mm -hmm. point. 
and I left the show at that point. So why? But I can find I can find out the answer. Is there a specific question about that uh, beautifully named bit? Um, I guess it's just that you remembered it, because um, he was one of the people who uh, he was the film. He was the uh, director of it, and I know Ooh. he told me he spoke with somebody. Uh, it might have been you. Uh, was it a writer? Yeah, somebody from the writer's room. Yeah. Oh, okay. You were submitted video. Mm -hmm. Wow, all right. So he submitted, he did the video? Yeah. Great, all right. What year would you say? Season three, episode 26. Wow, specific. Well, I mean, it might have been Scott. My buddy Scott was still back there writing it. It could have been uh, Nick Malice. Uh, who's now the head writer there, Nick, uh, mm -hmm. Michael O'Brien. Um, there's all my writers are still there that I hired. And that's the, which is a great, great thing about that show is all, all, a lot of those writers are still the same ones there. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Which is a very good sign, but they're always getting, you know, new material based on what they find and mm -hmm. stuff. The funny thing with that show was I came into it with a little heart and Tosh had none. And in fact, he calls his, production company Blackheart Productions. So he prides himself on not, he has like kind of no friends and no family, although he now has a family, which is amazing. But um, I brought up Web Redemption. My idea was Web Redemption. And he's like, what's that? And I was like, we're, it's easy to crap on these people. That's all that's being done on the internet. Why don't we do something different, which is take their side and give them a second chance. Now, they might fail again, but we win if they fail again. But Let's take their side and give them a, check, a second chance at redeeming themselves. And his answer to that was, why would we give these idiots a second chance? I was like, oh my God, just hear me out. So that was a good example of writing with someone or collaborating with someone who has a totally different point of view and making it work. Uh, you know, I, I moved the idea a little closer to him, but he came pretty far to you know, my side of Web Redemption. And, uh, and that's how Web Redemption kind of got on the air and became their signature bit. But, um, well, shit on my dick. If I was there, I think I would have uh, been very involved. Sounds mm -hmm. like a good idea. Yes, it, it, I just saw it. It's pretty funny. Okay, I will look it up. All right, thank you so much. That, that, see, that's a job. I think yeah. I was. Yeah, I think I was maybe right, thinking you couldn't make money with an idea like shit on my dick. Turns out you can. <laughs> Turns out it's a job. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, listen, down the road, if you find, I promise I'll have shorter answers. If you find you have any follow-up questions, which is often the case with journalists and people on projects, um, whenever you want, man. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Kate, it's good um, to see you. Thank you. Yeah. One more thing before you go. Sure. Um, just to help me find more people. I know you, you probably know like so many people with interesting jobs. If you want, would you mind just sending me like one of those people for sure. uh, a future interview? Thank you so much. And do you want it like in another field? Uh, anything. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let me think about it. Like, awesome. in, other, in other words, if it was a fisherman, that's fine too. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Let me think about it. It'll probably be in entertainment, but I just want to know. Mm. The parameters. Okay. Yeah. I definitely will. Thank you so much. All righty. Take it bye. easy. All right. Bye bye.